Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work. But producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Today, we are going to step into the phenomenon of being, or being called, a slob. And we anticipate that this excavation will unearth a truly messy topic. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't resist. (laughs) So one of my associations when I think about being a slob is my own kind of uh, life as a junior high school student and my absolute refusal to clean up my room. And I remember my uh, floor having, you know, eight inches worth of clothes on it and my mother coming to the door and tossing the clean clothes at me out of disgust because I absolutely refused to clean up my room, (laughs) which now is a little bit embarrassing and I can really understand her frustration. But I can remember how gratifying it was to really just be a slob and to resist the ordering impulse of my parents. So it felt like a rebellion? It was definitely rebellious and definitely passive aggressive. Mm I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I was a slob uh, in junior high and high school. And to tell you the truth, it might be the case that I still sort of am. And I don't, I don't know that I feel rebellious as much as, um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like an effort to kind of get at someone as much as it feels like, uh, I just don't have the time for that. I just don't care enough. So it was an issue of priorities. It feels sort of like that. Yeah. I, I think actually that's really interesting because people can be really slobby at home and then be very high functioning in other areas. Mm-hmm. So there is a feeling that there's only so much libido to go around and keeping the house tidy is not one of the areas that it wants to show up. Yeah. And for me, that feels almost, well, it does feel actually at this point fairly conscious, you know, that I, there's a lot of things I want to do. And there are things that I like to do that are meaningful to me. And cleaning the house is not one of them. Right. So this prioritization. Well, I was never a slob. Um, I've always liked a nice orderly room. I remember as a child, I had a collection of uh, miniature dogs, and I took great pleasure in arranging them around on the shelf in my bedroom. I also had a stepmother who was an operating room nurse. Wow. And she was orderly to the point of obsession. And the very worst thing you could possibly be in this world, in her view, uh, was not an axe murderer or a sociopath, uh, but a slob. And to this day, I am a fairly orderly person. I like uh, a harmonious and neat uh, living arrangement. And it also serves as a way for me to move around a little, have a change of pace for administrative stuff or just sitting with with clients. It's actually kind of a nice change of pace to wash some dishes, do some laundry, tidy up the living room. Uh, so I'm very interested in this topic of being 
a slob and what it takes because it appeals to me to kind of let go of of all of that, of just have it not be so important, not to have it matter. Relax. We'll turn you into card-carrying slob by the end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I should add that when we had for a while a uh, our granddaughter, who was a teenager then, was staying with us. I was intrigued, not outraged at all, but simply intrigued that the room she stayed in was literally covered with her clothes and her stuff. There was no floor to be seen at all. And I was absolutely intrigued by it, just fascinated. Yeah, I don't really find, I have teenagers and I don't actually really find that so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to live with it all the time. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Deb, because as you were talking, I found myself wondering if the tendency to be a slob might be related to typology. But mm. but typologically, you and I are very similar. Yeah. And so I don't know that that explains it. No, I think it, I mean, if we want to drop down a, another level, I think it has something to do with our relationship to outer objects, mm -hmm. which um, absolutely changes over the course of the lifetime and um, can change depending on the object. So for instance, as a feeling type, if we're going to bring typology into it, mm -hmm. you know, um, I, and I think other feeling types, have a tendency to invest outer objects. And, and let me clarify, being an extroverted feeling type, we have a tendency to invest outer objects with feeling tones. Mm -hmm. We have feelings about those things. And so we have a tendency to want to take care of them in different ways. And conversely, if an object loses its feeling value, it can all of a sudden float away into disrepair or not tending it in a particular way. But I was interested, Deb, when you were talking about the difference between the experience of restoring order, setting something in order, and the pleasure that that can bring. I, I find that to be really, really relevant. And I think of so many clients who are fighting a battle, let's say with organizing their offices, which can be in tremendous disarray, and the incredible amount of relief that they feel after it's restored to order and they can find what they need easily. And the tremendous amount of resistance and sometimes even agony as they approach the task of bringing order out of chaos. Yeah, that can be a place where people get really stuck to can't it, you know, like people come in and say, I know I need to clean, you know, I know I need to tidy my, my house or something, but they just can't week after week after week, they come in and they sort of identify this as a problem. And it seems to me, you know, you're talking about this kind of uh, rebellion against parental authority, that it can almost be a way of, of rebelling against the need to kind of conform or meet the demands of the world. It can be a way of kind of opting out, a stubborn way of asserting something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to play. And that reminds me of my own transformation that, as I said, in junior high school, I was really a slob. And then all of a sudden, at around 16 years old, it's as if I woke up to myself and particularly woke up to my capacity for will, willpower. And then I went through a radical change and, and became almost Spartan in my discipline around tending my room and my appearance and other kinds of functions, and then became very rigorous about order and organizing. So all the sort of um, ego energy right. to move forward in the world. Yes, and I think that this idea of um, cleaning and ordering one's environment is a value that's very much part of the conscious mind, the conscious life. Absolutely. I'm aware that for some people, the how to organize is is really problematic. It has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence or education, but a, a kind of place inside that says, I, I just don't know how to organize all my papers. I don't know how to set up my kitchen or organize my closet. And it sets up a place where uh, of confusion and a sense of um, that this is going to defeat me. And so I just avoid it 
Oh. Yeah, but it's not rocket science, right? So I know what you're talking about, but I think that experience of sort of overwhelm in the face of these tasks is something like there's not quite enough energy in the ego for this, or, or it's feeling mm-hmm. swamped from something underneath, right? I agree that there is the feeling of of overwhelm. There certainly is an intense feeling that comes up. And um, because of my years long ago as a special ed teacher working with teenagers, I was I'm also aware that that people don't always know what the organizing principle is. And if you don't have that organizing principle that you're going to sort all your books according to the colors on the book spine, or you're going to sort all your books according to the author's last name, or you're going to file all your papers in thus and such a way, that uh, people really can be stumped by what the categories are. It feels like too big a task. Yes. Well, and that the solution is strategies that there really is a kind of a lacuna for mm-hmm. some people mm-hmm. or maybe particularly very young people and it's a de- and it's kind of a developmental kind of gateway to be interested in learning how to manage parts of mm-hmm. life mm-hmm. and I, and i associate that as in some people some of the time with being asked maybe to do too much when one was too young Hmm. and didn't have the skills or the energy to, to cope with something. And so here's something where some support is needed or some help is needed. Hence, this burgeoning industry of organizers uh, like Marie Kondo, mm-hmm. who helps people figure out how to go about ordering their homes. Yeah, I, I actually find her book really interesting. <laughs> and, and in a way, I think it's, you know, it's actually kind of Jungian because uh, even though it's sort of endlessly spoofable, this whole idea that objects have uh, magic in them. Yes. That we can have a relationship with spaces and buildings and rooms and stuff. You know, she she has this, I mean, it's sort of funny, but and yet it sort of appeals to me that that you talk to your things and you, you know, you roll up your socks in a certain way so that they don't get tired. Yes. You know, it's like the world is ensouled. The world is ensouled. And I think about what um what you said earlier about how you how one feels about one's things. Of where is the quality of love of this is my home? <laughs> These are my socks. Uh, having a relationship w- with one's objects, um, and of course, they're all sort of out picturings of mm-hmm, us. Mm-hmm. You know, just as the pictures on our walls are, or uh, you know, the objects that we choose, we all sort of out picture ourselves in the colors, the art, the rooms, the what they contain. Well, we project our inner world yes. onto our material beliefs. Yes. In some sense we can't help. And but it do seems that. to me a shame not to love it. Mm-hmm. Not to love the self that is projected out there in all of the papers, the objects, the books. So just taking that a step further, I mean, I'm thinking of, and by the way, I would say that it's a pretty common thing in my practice anyway, that people come in and one of the things they want to talk about is a disturbed relationship with stuff, that their houses are cluttered to the point where they feel like they can't function, uh, that they uh, feel really torn about the stuff they have. They feel like they have too much stuff and they want to get rid of it. I mean, it sort of goes on, right? And and I, I can see, Deb, I, I think you put it really well that we could love that self that is projected into the material world. And you know, I, I don't think it's just uh, you know, a coincidence, let's say, that the people that feel very overwhelmed by the clutter in their house feel often feel very badly about themselves too. Mm-hmm. So maybe the flip side of loving the self that is out pictured in objects is also being able to say goodbye. Mm-hmm. to you know some of those mugs for example <laughs> or socks or sweaters from high school whatever it might be but uh, what does it mean to separate from your stuff right, the process of investing and also divesting 
pulling mm-hmm. the value out of something. Exactly. I have a, had a, a moment that I'm suddenly remembering so clearly that um, when my grandparents died, you know, the family was going through the belongings, and at that point, I was uh, a college kid, and so uh, I took my grandparents' television, which is one of these enormous <laughs> televisions. I mean, it, it must have weighed 60 pounds with those great big tubes mm-hmm. and all of that. And um, I lugged it around with me for years and had this tremendous amount of feeling about watching television on this thing. Well, the technology was parading forward <laughs> for decades. <laughs> and I was like nursing this enormous object. <laughs> and, and at some point I had to really decide to kind of pull my nostalgia out of the object and finally just throw it away because it was ridiculous to be kind of dragging it along like Sisyphus. Mm-hmm. But, I, but I understand the power depending on the potency of the memories. Yeah, and, and in some sense, I think that our, the way that our, we as a culture invest stuff with import and emotion and sentimentality and have such trouble divesting it mm-hmm. like you're talking about, you know, it speaks to our tendency to concretize. And our ability to hold things in a kind of liminal or symbolic space. Because I think, you know, what you did eventually is you looked at the television and you thought, there's some space between that physical object and this feeling in my heart about my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I can, you know, I can separate them somehow, you know. Um, but, But I think we tend to be awfully concrete and when we're overly concrete, then we're really stuck in matter, in you know, the material world. And that's partly where I think our disturbed relationship with stuff comes from. In, in that way, we're, we're talking about not being able to let things go, that the eliminatory function of the psyche is somehow blocked. There's kind of a constipation in the psyche. I think that's what I think hear you saying. I was thinking about it a little differently, but keep going. <laughs> well, it, well, where it leads me to is um, uh, is hoarding behaviors, mm-hmm. and uh, there's actually a wonderful book out there called "Buried in Treasures," mm. which which really looks at this relationship to objects and how um, we can constantly invest in objects that have no actual intrinsic value, and also underneath that not have a confidence in our psyche's ability to keep us in relationship to the thoughts and memories that accrete around the objects. So we falsely fear that if the object goes away, then my feelings and memories related to the object will no longer be accessible to me, that the mass of objects has become an anchor. And and we know that we do this, you know, because people when they travel want souvenirs. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. A talisman. Yeah, Deb, that's a that's a great example that we need something concrete to remind us of something. And of course, you know, I think that this is kind of what the Old Testament is, is getting at when it talks about, you know, you you, you shouldn't uh, worship idols. It's like, you know, when when the when the god, the principle, the symbol, the energy has become too invested in an object and we mistake the object for that symbolic energy. And what I'm thinking about is how uh, something can be very symbolic at one point that you've maybe gone on a special trip or uh, had an unusual experience. And so let's say you you took a a stone, a special stone from the seaside, Mm -hmm. and you kept it somewhere on your desk or bedside table or something to remind you of what you felt and what the experience was like that special day, let's say, at the beach. But six months later or or a year later, um, if there have been many of those kinds of objects, they, they tend to sort of lose their special vibe. And then it's just a stone. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a natural trajectory. I'm thinking about how angels, you know, back uh, in biblical times were awesome and amazing uh, kinds of experiences. And and now we see them on Valentine's Day cards. Mm -hmm. So when does the symbol uh, lose its potency Mm -hmm. and just become a thing? Mm -hmm. This reminds me of Winnicott's ideas of transitional objects, Mm -hmm. that there is something in the soul that to manage anxiety will invest an object with 
sometimes a tremendous amount of potency and emotional potency. And then the feeling that in order to access what it represents, we have to have it around us. So, you know, little Debbie drags her blankie around for years. And then Winnicott would say, How don't, you know? I knew I could feel it. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, you know, the blanket is just found in the yard somewhere. Yes. And Debbie's off on her bicycle. Mm-hmm. And at that point, there's a natural letting go of the transitional object as a developmental process. But when that's somehow interrupted, and then too many things become transitional objects and they're not internalized as internal symbolic objects, then all of a sudden there's this incredible backing up mm-hmm. of things. Mm-hmm. At least it reminds me of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe what we're saying is that as adults, uh, especially, there's a relation to a symbolic function that a lot of objects can have, our, our books, our art, um, whatever it may be. And that if we don't have a symbolic relationship to some of that, then it's just stuff and we've got clutter. Yeah, I mean, you know, Jung always said the symbol always points to something beyond itself. Right. I mean, so w- the symbol never can really encompass the full uh, breadth and expansiveness of the thing to which it points. So, you know, if we have that stone from the seaside, it, in a sense, it's a symbol of of an experience that we had, and it, we can maybe have contact with it through the stone. But we can't mistake the stone for the thing which it represents. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And that at some point, those feelings can and should really be integrated and assimilated internally. Mm -hmm. So so that would be when there is a kind of particularly invested object. And again, that seems a little bit more like hoarding. It seems a little bit more like needing everything around Mm -hmm. one all the time Mm -hmm. in order to keep uh, some kind of a relationship to the memories. Mm -hmm. But I think there's another way in which, you know, slobbiness can manifest in the world, which reminds me more of that kind of malaise and there's and lack of energy, that the natural entropy of the world deposits crap into our lives, whether it's <laughs> leaves that are tracked in through the front door mm-hmm. and a, a dirty paper plates and unwashed dishes and just the detris mm-hmm. of life and the natural drift, you know, that Uh, nature is causing disorder and decay all around us. Mm -hmm. And rather than, you know, the dirty paper plate being invested with some kind of a value, (laughs) but there's a way in which the whole archetype of ordering and the whole energy to fight that natural decay Mm -hmm. is somehow not rallying in the psyche. This kind of exhaustion. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, just to kind of keep this in in the archetypal, I mean, I th- I think that ordering is an activity of consciousness, mm-hmm. and that the unconscious is relatively chaotic, mm-hmm. and ordering your life, your house, your thoughts requires a lot of ego conscious energy. Absolutely, it's uniquely human. And and we could think about it in terms of sort of the masculine and the feminine too if we mm-hmm. if we wanted to use that terminology. And I'm still going back to the the feeling tone that we we feel it when we walk into a house or a, a room that's really slovenly with old paper plates and pizza boxes and no, De- Deborah, are you uh, trying to give me a message here? <laughs> <laughs> and Coke cans and no. <laughs> not at it's all. Not it's not bad. you, Lisa. <laughs> so, but but it's about loving and what is our right mm-hmm. relationship relationship to the world around us and to ourselves Mm -hmm. if we we don't care for our homes our room our objects our uh all of those things that we surround ourselves with Uh, and on the other hand if we care too much or care in the wrong way that every little souvenir and object uh from for the last 35 years has to be cluttered up on shelves that there's a feeling tone here of am i in right relation to myself in my surroundings 
And and if I can riff on that for a second, this is something I've thought a little a bit about that I, I think, you know, people always say, oh, oh, our culture is so materialistic. But in some sense, I think it's because we don't value stuff enough. I agree. And if we really kind of love our stuff and love the, the matter, the mother, you know, matter comes from mm-hmm. the Latin word for mother, material, matrix are all from that root. Uh, then we would find that we had a right relationship with it, I think, and we wouldn't need to consume so much. You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, if you're if if you're if you're eating empty calories, you may you may be full all the time, but you're not nourished. And I think something because we don't we we're not nourishing ourselves with our stuff, we're not loving it. We we sort of blindly consume more stuff. We go out and we buy. We buy more clothes, even though we haven't taken the tags off those that we bought two weeks ago, you know, because we haven't allowed ourselves to have an imaginative and sold relationship with it. So we're really actually devaluing stuff. Right. Abundance becomes excess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It becomes greed. And it's... Yeah. And all of our stuff comes from Mother Earth, right? Uh, Well, I wonder about that in a way. I mean, yes and no, because I'm thinking about, for example, all the plastic that at some point- But that gets extracted from the ground. It's a a product of- But how different that is, I Mm -hmm. think. Uh, We're so distant from it. Right. By the time it becomes a plastic dish or a straw or a cup or something, it, it does not have the feel of Earth, Earth is sort of like a distant relation uh, versus something that's carved out of wood yes. or pottery that someone made by hand. Mm-hmm. And we uh, there's there's an exhibit in a museum in Connecticut about handheld objects mm-hmm. and what the relationship is to those things that have been made by hand and have a special feel to them. And in our world, there's so much there's abundance and so mm-hmm. much throwaway stuff. Um, that, that we're doesn't... encouraged to dissociate from yes. the sense that this was part of the mother. Yes, it's come. A, it's gone a long, long way mm-hmm. from having a relationship to the earth. So uh, I'm noticing in our conversation that we're kind of going to the medicine, uh, I think a little um, quickly, the medicine of loving and appreciating objects and appreciating its relationship to the archetype of mother and earth, and perhaps even prioritizing acquiring objects that are valuable instead of throwaway. But I think we've um, strayed a little bit from the idea of slob and slobbiness. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So um, I find myself wanting to return to just the etymology of the word slob. And as I was poking around uh, this word, it traces back to uh, Irish language and then Scandinavian language, where the word I believe was pronounced slob, um, A-B, S-L-A-B, and it meant a uh, sludge and oozing and and mud and dirt. Isn't that interesting? Dirt. It's um, it's. It's a uh, mother earth it's, again. Yeah, it's earthy. It's earthy, mm-hmm. but it's also uh, to me reminds me of that kind of depressed, yeah, definitely ex- field. You know, I think of the times I've been hiking, and suddenly your your foot descends down into real putrid muck. Mm-hmm. You know, it's full of leaves and yeah. it's rotting down. And there's a way in which it kind of really traps your foot, and it takes energy to wrench it out. And even the wrenching process is, you know, it can smell terrible as you're mm-hmm. dredging up the old mud. Mm-hmm. So when I think of clients now who talk about being, you know, caught in the mud of slobbiness, that you know they're sitting watching television and they can see that there are 14 dirty pizza boxes and they mm-hmm. can smell them mm-hmm. when they come into the room but that those pizza boxes really are like a mire yes of mud yes that they just can't get their feet through or their hands on mm-hmm. or the energy to want to throw them away so when when you have clients like that and I you know I've worked with people like that too what do you what do you think is going on I actually think that it's very complicated related to each person mm-hmm. um, if they've brought it in because of course we don't see how our clients live 
So we're depending on them to report it as a problem. So the fact that they would be reporting it as an issue means there's some kind of consciousness that is curious about the behavior or in suffering about the behavior. So I will often explore, first of all, how they're interpreting it. What do you call slobbiness? And what would not slobbiness mm -hmm, look like? Mm -hmm. Because some people who, let's say, have a predisposition towards obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, slobbiness might be that the tissue box is not oriented correctly to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, everything mm -hmm. is extremely relative to kind of an internal paradigm. Mm -hmm. But let's let's assume that it, it it would be culturally recognized as slobbiness. Like fourteen pizza boxes. Like fourteen pizza boxes, and you know, eight weeks of undone laundry in the bedroom. Eight weeks is a lot. <laughs> that was a joke. 80 weeks of undone laundry, I'm not judging, <laughs> uh, is somehow in the house. And some part of the person is recognizing it's a problem. They're telling me that they don't want friends to come over. Mm -hmm, they don't want yes. to bring a date to the house. So there's some observing Absolutely. ego that's looking at this saying, wow, uh, I'm outside the cultural norm. And this is costing me something in the environment. Cutting to the chase a little bit, one of the things that I want to work with is the cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. I want to actually sit in the tension and even bring the tension forward in the same way that, you know, when my foot sank down up to my calf in the mud, I had to rally a certain kind of muscle tension to pull my leg up. If my legs were just collapsed, or if I had no muscle tone, you know, my leg would just sit there. So we will talk a lot about in great specificity, each of the boxes. How did they get there? How long have they been there? What about the clothes? I mean, really bringing the picture mm -hmm. of what is mm -hmm. in the room mm -hmm. that they cannot mobilize around. Yeah. And then the fantasy of how they think it should be. And as they hold the tension of the opposites between what they think uh, an acceptable or a proud living mm -hmm. space might be mm -hmm. and what actually is there to really <laughs> is it a term that you use sometimes in, in sales called stirring the pain mm -hmm. which is you really sit in the juncture of the opposites and you keep coming back to the tension of what it's like mm -hmm. for those things not to be resolved mm -hmm. so it reminds me what you're saying of uh what we do when we're analyzing a dream that there is the conscious mind and the person going about his or her life and then at night another voice comes in from the unconscious to give us sometimes a very different picture a different perspective on what's going on and i'm thinking about uh what you're saying about this a hypothetical room with all the pizza boxes of there's the dream it's a dream in the world mm -hmm. yeah in the lived daily world but it's a dream and what does this dream mean what is it saying while the conscious voice says it really shouldn't be like this i want to be able to have friends over but i can't because okay there's the tension of unconscious and consciousness are in very, very different places. And until it's understood, the unconscious tends to have its way with us. Mm -hmm. And it's in the tension um, that something we call the transcendent function, if we're lucky, will save us. Mm -hmm. So we could collapse into the slobbiness, which would really to be collapse into that aspect of nature where things are just tended by decay and natural process. So in that way, then, you know, the room becomes kind of a forest floor mm -hmm. where things fall onto the floor and the bones <laughs> of animals just fall and decay. And mm -hmm. this kind of, you know, forest litter process <laughs> goes on. I know that sounds so dramatic, but I got to tell you, people live like that. Yeah, I know. They live like that. And, and I mean, in the most extreme example, you know, some people have had, you know, pets die in their homes. I know. You know, and then they find them as they're kind of excavating years of trash out of their homes. I, I mean, I know that's such a horrifying worst case scenario, yep. but you know, the pizza box is no different than you know having a mulch pile, you know, up to your ceiling of stuff you're waiting to just rot down into soil or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we could, but that's associated with the unconscious. You know, that my, you know, room is somehow going to be, as I said, a forest floor. Mm -hmm. Then the other side of it is this kind of Apollonian order, this idea of bringing kind of civilization into the wilderness. So 
as we hold those two things, as you were saying with the dream, let's imagine what one would have to find holding that tension. There's the, the naturalness of disorder, or what we would call slobbiness, and the Apollonic, bright, shiny, aesthetic of, of a beautifully kept home. And when those two things collide, what is it that allows somebody to move forward and to not be locked? That's a, that's a great image, Joseph. And as I sit with it, what I'm aware of is I think one of the things that keeps that, uh, that the transcendent function, if you will, from constellating sometimes is shame. Just mm. deep, deep shame that makes it difficult to do other than to stay in the mire. So let's rest into that a little more. So are, are you saying that the, the shame traps somebody in the mud of sloppiness mm -hmm. where they Which can't Which then, of mobilize. course, becomes self-reinforcing. Mm -hmm. and, and I can relate to that. I think that shame has such a deadening mm -hmm. effect mm -hmm. and such a, a, a feeling of hopelessness. And I, you know, one of the things that I will do sometimes is just as you're saying, you know, really take me into it. How bad is it? In fact, I'll encourage people to bring me a photograph. And sometimes they can't because being seen heals the shame. So if they can tell me their very worst or show it to me and we can sit with that together, then maybe it'll sort of pierce the isolation and they won't be alone with it. And the shame will be a little bit healed and then it can be held in our relationship a bit. And I don't know that that's necessarily going to constellate the Apollonian, but perhaps it's a step along the path. Well, you know, at the beginning, I was facetious when I said uh, that we were maybe going to have kind of a messy conversation. But I, I think that really is it, is can we together go to that messy place, go to the muck, the forest floor, the, the mud that you sink your foot into, of the place of real inner messiness as it's depicted in the world, can we be there together uh, and hold it differently? I'd be interested in it and be compassionate toward it mm -hmm. uh, without either indulging it and saying, oh, never mind all those pizza boxes, or and also without being punitive of uh, this is really terrible. You, you really must do something about this. So I think I'm back to the mother because that's mm -hmm. what a good mother does is to go there with some compassion uh, that is neither too indulgent nor too punitive. Mm -hmm. So that would be one way of conceptualizing the analytic attitude mm -hmm. and seeing sloppiness as a developmental challenge regardless of the chronological age of the person. I, I find myself thinking about that kind of disorder sometimes as a defense. Absolutely. And a defense against affect. Mm -hmm. That there's something in the person's psychology that finds the deadening effect of disorder comforting, and it keeps them away either from anger or grief or uh, romantic tensions. So I'm often interested in what it is that they feel the messiness is keeping them from. Mm -hmm. Or anger. It sort of or just anger. takes the edge off anger and lets it kind of become simmering resentment. Because mm -hmm. I think that when the, when the disorder is interrupted, often there'll be a flare of affect. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, sometimes we can see these television shows on hoarding, and when people's homes are, uh, are often taken from them, or family members come just out of total despair and they start you know dragging things out of the home the decompensation mm -hmm. that uh, people will often observe in the hoarding person now we could think of it as decompensation but also the affect that's released the crying the rage the helplessness which we could then imagine is always present and somehow assuaged under this kind of mounds of leaf litter these mounds of mulch. But just like mulch, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but if you create a huge pile of mulch and you just leave it there, and then maybe several months later, you just suddenly open up, it's steaming at yes, the bottom. Yes, it's hot. 
And sometimes mulch piles will uh, spontaneously combust and they'll catch fire. I think that's a useful image mm -hmm. that we're looking for the spark that could set this on fire. And if we think about it symbolically as a purifying fire mm -hmm. that can burn something down and burn through all the layers of junk that are there and leave something clean, psychologically clean. And then as a result of that, perhaps even environmentally clean mm -hmm. in terms of how they're living. So, so you're saying that, that the clutter or the mess, the dirt, the muck, is a defense against feeling. Uh, better to have the feelings that I have of, or I can say I'm embarrassed and I'm frustrated by my mess, but those are easier to have than other feelings that might be much more chaotic and, and much more intense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of our work in excavating down mm -hmm. in the mulch pile to find where the heat is, to find the is fire, to keep pulling away yeah over and again. So somebody might want to talk about, and, I, and I've had this experience where people will come in and maybe spend weeks talking about the pizza boxes or some version of mm -hmm. that as a way of actually misdirecting, staying on the surface of the mulch pile. Mm -hmm. yes. And then for us to be able to look at the nuances that are pointing us much deeper mm -hmm. yes. than actually the surface level of what's collecting around the environment. Yeah, I want to uh, amplify your image just a little bit, Joseph, about the idea that there would be heat in the mulch pile. Because I, I think one of the things I wonder about when anyone comes in who's very, very stuck is uh, what is the relationship between the ego and the unconscious? Or in Jungian terms, sort of where is the ego self axis? And, and a lot of times that's one of the ways that I've formulate cases like this is that there's some disturbance there. There's some, there's some inability for the energy in the unconscious to constellate around a particular aim so that the ego lines up with that. And I think that that can be, you know, about a lot of different things, but just maybe that's one way to think about it. So maybe um, can you quickly define what the ego self access is? Well, it's a well-known idea that tells us that the self with a capital S, which Jung considered to be the guiding center of the psyche, is able to have some access to consciousness, that there's a relationship between the conscious personality and the guiding self. And sometimes uh, that, that, that relationship is pretty clear and uncluttered, so to speak. And we feel in a, in a sense of, you know, at oneness with our, our deepest desires for ourself. And we can move out into the world in service to those. But sometimes the ego gets its own idea about what it needs to do. And it's kind of working at cross purposes with this deeper aim. That can be one way in which the ego self access might be disturbed. I think in this case, it feels a little bit more like you can't find it. You can't find what the self wants for you. A direction. Yes, but I, as you're to reminding me yeah. about ego self access and the psychology of that, that um, for the infant or for the child, you know, the ego is in the self. That there's a merger. So there's a way in which, in early in life, the ego and nature are merged, and there is something about the littered space or the degraded personal appearance in some fashion, which returns one back to that kind of infant state of waiting for the great mother to organize the environment or to clean me up. Mm -hmm. And that one, the ego has to rise out of the primal mother, the littered nature floor of the mm -hmm. forest mm -hmm. in order to have an access mm -hmm. and, and attention between mm -hmm. the two, which then is creative. Yeah, that, that sounds just right. We keep returning to the archetype of the mother. Uh, I just want to sort of underscore that, that again and again, we're circling around matter and mother and the matrix and how we become, how we order ourselves, our own psyches, our own personalities, how we order the living spaces, how we order our own clothes and our lives of to, to climb out of that matrix and have a relationship 
with the unconscious, with the self. Um, but we need a well-defined ego in order to be able to have some order. Yes, I, I think that's just right. And and just to kind of say it in slightly different language, it's like if we don't have that ego stance outside of it, then we're just in it. And you can think about the person literally living in, you know, floor to ceiling clutter. Like they're, they're just they're in the in mulch it, pile. Right. And they don't have that sort of separate ego stance that would create that tension. And you can't have a relationship with something unless you're outside of it. Yes. So right. so there's a way in which and we were saying this in different language at the beginning of the podcast, that part of that messiness, part of that accumulation of objects and disorder has to do with a kind of merger. And that merger is still, at least in that realm, still happening in a way that is impairing their functioning in the social environment. And by the way, that's what makes it a problem. All of us can be messy. We have a drunk drawer, and perhaps that even keeps us sane. We have this little area where disorder reigns. Yeah, mine is. And everything in the house could be meticulous. (laughs) Well, there you go. But we need to have a little bit of disorder. But it's when the merger and the disorder really begins to interfere with our ability to have a reasonably successful Mm -hmm. life that then it comes to the attention of the analyst. And, and it becomes an issue to be worked on. Yeah, and I, I can't resist just, I, I realize that I'm opening up another can of worms, so maybe we can talk about this in a separate episode. But one of the things that I've noticed is I've had a number of people over the years who report that there was such clutter in their childhood homes that they couldn't have friends over. And and I think it's almost like a sort of subset of, uh, of a, like a dysfunctional family where mm. the home is so messy that people can't function in it. That impacts the child for the rest of their lives. How isolating that is. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm kind of building on that to say that I can think of a couple of people who didn't come from overtly disorderly or chaotic, dysfunctional homes. But where the dysfunction was, was in the emotional realm of certain feelings, certain kinds of agency that the child could not have, especially access to aggression and anger and all the rest of it, a certain kind of implicit but substantial demand for compliance, conformity, and staying in an emotional container, an emotional matrix that didn't allow that child to separate enough and can then be manifested later as too much stuff. I don't know how to organize Mm -hmm. my stuff. Where's my sense of agency? Where's my aggression that I can get rid of some of these mugs or the pizza boxes or whatever it is? Mm -hmm. Um, Because I didn't have the practice in being a separate person Mm -hmm. with my own wants and needs and preferences as a child. And so one of the terms that shows up in our work is they'll refer to that as the masa confusa, <laughs> yes. where everything mm-hmm. is yeah. blended yes. internally. Yes. All the feelings, all the images, all the body sensations are one big churning cloud mm-hmm. with little things poking out of it. Mm-hmm. And that if that's carried into adulthood, that difficulty or that inadequate differentiation yeah. in the inner world then creates all kinds of problems like with differentiation yeah, yeah in exactly. the outer world and there's a cost to Ex- that exactly so, so i hope that what we're leaving the listeners with and you can hear us in the masa confusa <laughs> yes. you know you know looking at these how big this issue is what mm-hmm. enormous pile of ideas there is around here yeah it has been that way, hasn't it? But it's challenging, and I think we all really feel for people that struggle with this. Yeah. So perhaps As a we good just place. have. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think we'll move on to a dream. And the dream that we have today, the dreamer is male, 27 years old, and in IT support. And here's the dream. I am swimming in an indoor public pool with others when waves begin to occur for no apparent or antecedent reason. I am in a pool that shouldn't have waves. As the waves begin to bob me around, 
the water level rises dramatically quickly. The water reaches nearly to the top of a cinder block retaining wall that is protecting a sunny, sacred green forest glade with a shrine far down below. Another person I don't recognize, also male about my age, begins to chip away at the retaining wall, cracking, crumbling it until it gives way. Darkness rushes in violently and I awake to see myself in the third person floating in dank, dark blue, murky waters, water that is endless in form and size. A graphic overlay of five hearts, much like a Zelda video game's heart display, is shown on top of me as I float alive, but ultimately devoured by the flood. And in terms of significant context about the dream, the dreamer mentions, uh, I have made the decision to enter analysis with a Jungian analyst, but no notable life context comes to mind. My wife and I are in relationship counseling to work out our conflict patterns. And having picked up Jung in the last six months or so, the therapist suggested a local Jungian analyst I could contact. <laughs> and the main feelings in the dream, the dreamer says, first fear and trepidation at the rising water, then suffocation and buriedness post-flood, not in a peaceful way, but annihilative. So I have lots of thoughts. I guess the first thing that I noticed is that the dreamer is in a pool that shouldn't have waves. This should be nice and placid. There's sort of a, an, a, mis a mismatch between reality and expectations. Say more about that. Well, um, what I'm where I'm going is the streamer is 27. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways is on the threshold of a sort of maturing into full adult status, which I tend to think actually happens at the end of the 20s. Mm -hmm. And somehow this dreamer thought that things were going to be relatively easy. But there's a new relationship perhaps with the psyche and maybe with the unconscious that's taken this dreamer by surprise. Yes. The unconscious is very often imaged as water. And that's a uh, straight young. And there's a tremendous contrast between this pool that starts out as sort of a benign image of a public pool, and then the water level rises, and eventually it becomes uh, a flood in dark, dank, murky water. Of, un and of unending size. Of I mean, it's exactly. That's uh, And this other split to the sunny, sacred green forest glade with a shrine. So I'm thinking there's a real contrast between sort of this instinctual or unconscious uh, energy that kind of takes over in the image of the flood and this perhaps idealized uh, kind of sunny, lovely forest glade. Yeah, perhaps the dreamer, I mean, here's one imagination, perhaps the dreamer thought that an encounter with the unconscious was going to be like the sunny, sacred glade. But in fact, it's much more like this terrifying flood. This can often happen is that when we invite communication and a relationship with the unconscious, the unconscious can rise up and say, um, here I am. Uh, with all kinds of stuff that was uh, held in abatement for many years with by the retaining wall, and um, it can feel overwhelming. And but I'm also very interested in uh, mm -hmm. the ending, the lysis of the dream, because it's a, uh, such a surprise. It's like right at the end of the dream, something very unusual happens. There's a graphic overlay of five hearts like a Zelda video games heart display. So there seems to be a note of, of optimism here, and it's a video game, and it's an adventure game. And I looked it up. It's called The Legend of Zelda, mm -hmm. Breath of the Wild. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I certainly have never played it, but there are five hearts. So it seems that... Uh, you know, there may be a note of encouragement here uh, that despite how it feels to the dream ego, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. yeah. else is also coming in. It's not just an unending flood with the dark, murky waters. Right, that's how there, it feels to the ego. This is an adventure game. 
Well, now, <laughs> the interesting thing is if I had the dreamer here, I would be curious about uh, more about the game and what role the hearts play in the game. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the meaning in the game to to get a lock on that a little bit more. But I think you're, you're I agree with you, Deb. Uh, I find myself drawn to the image of a male about his age mm-hmm. chipping away at the retaining wall, cracking, crumbling until it gives way. Mm-hmm. So that there is a really active uh, aspect of the psyche that is in collusion Mm -hmm. with this idea of letting go of the retaining tension inside of the psyche. So I would have a certain kind of fantasy without knowing this fellow, but this fantasy that however the psyche was structured early on in life, there was a high value on this idea of retaining, this idea of containing, restraining passions, restraining feelings. Well, we might see it as like an ego function or a defense. Or a defense, right? mm-hmm. or just a value right. that you're raised in a culture that highly values restraint. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's not uncommon, actually, particularly for men. Mm-hmm. Strong and silent and stoic and you know driven in a certain kind of way. So there's a lot of paradigms that are not even necessarily pathologic that can cause a young man to feel that everything should be kind of locked up Mm -hmm. inside of him. And then there's a figure which I might uh, explore as a shadow figure. Exactly. That there's a whole other side of the personality that is not in support. Tear down that wall. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. (laughs) Um, And is really sick and tired Mm -hmm. of all the separation and containment and really wants things to flow. Which I I think is, I had the same thoughts, Joseph. And I think that that's actually, you know, because this is a little, this is one of those dreams where you read it and you think, hmm, is this is this kind of really signaling something pretty dark and potentially destructive? I mean, I think dreams like this can go in that direction. But this is one of the elements in the dream that made me feel good about this flood. Exactly. Because there's some part of the psyche that knows this needs to happen. Yeah. Wants, really wants yeah. it to happen. And, mm-hmm. and he has entered a Jungian analysis, mm-hmm. you know, so this is a a little flip, but it's kind of be careful what you wish for. Yeah, yeah. It's you, like- you really wanted to enter a Jungian analysis and meet parts of yourself that either were were never known or not allowed to really grow or had to be repressed or suppressed. And um, here you are, Mm -hmm. here they come. And that there is, it's a male about the same age as the dreamer. Mm -hmm. So we know, you know, it's a part of him that says, as you said, you know, tear down that wall. Absolutely. And and I'm looking at the image of the, the dark, rushing, violent water. And And all the psychological metaphors that we could bring forward, you know, that could be an enormous amount of sexuality Mm -hmm. or sexuality in a way that surprises the person. Mm -hmm. It could be anger or any number of other passions or feelings that are so powerful, Mm -hmm. powerful enough to wash away what the ego thought he was and what the ego where the ego thought he was going. And again, another another detail here that makes me feel less apprehensive about this dream is the age of the dreamer. Mm-hmm. Because I think that oftentimes, 27, 28, there can be a sort of washing away of who we thought we were and a reconstitution of the conscious personality along lines that feel a little more authentic. I think that that's mm-hmm. my experience is that that can this can be a really developmental place where there is a kind of ego death. And the, the dreamer does say that the feeling at the end of the dream is annihilative. Mm-hmm. So the person that he was is going to get washed away, we might yes. imagine. If we step back again into pure psychological language, when someone's old life is washed away and they are floating um, alive in all of this fluid, you know, that's an image of returning to the womb. Mm -hmm. So we could also call this a regression, Mm -hmm. that when the life force is released from its current containers, it tends to wash back into a primal state out of which 
something new emerges. I, I'm thinking about uh, flood mythology. And wasn't there a flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh? Yes, there was. And of course, there's the famous flood that's in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and there's one in Hindu mythology as well. So there, there is a washing away and an annihilation of land, which could be analogous to consciousness. And it feels awful. Mm -hmm. It feels really awful. Well, well, the washing, the being sucked into the water later in life when one has a strong ego, the salutio is frightening. Mm -hmm. If we were particularly childish, salutio experiences are actually very joyous. But to this person, being washed into the great ocean is actually a giving up, like you said, an annihilation of all the values and identity, or many of them. But I can't go with the womb imagery that you just offered, because this is an image of something that is uncontained, from a public pool to endless, this dank, endless water size. that is devouring. So this is a real image of a kind of, of chaos not sort of a, a womb-like container. And it makes me wonder if, if there's a little too much uncontained mm -hmm. energy from, from the unconscious right now. Mm -hmm. Although, as I say, I do pay a lot of attention to the five hearts and this video game. Well, you know, on that, it's sort of like, Joseph, you were talking about the retaining wall and, and this, I mean, it's cinder block. It's a real rigid structure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people who have a very rigid psychic structure have that because there's so much in the unconscious that's sort of bursting to get out and they they don't have a sort of flexible relationship with that content so you know as rigid as someone's defenses might be is often a good sense of how much uncontainable stuff there might be in the unconscious yeah. i think another note that's uh a possible uh, optimistic sort of telos or trajectory of the dream is that Zelda is a female. Mm -hmm. And there are five hearts. And it makes me wonder if there is something that is emerging. Kind of a of new a, contact with the feeling function. Yeah, the yeah. feeling function of the hearts and this powerful, zesty, I imagine, uh, woman mm -hmm. who's the star uh, of the of the video games. That there is so it's not only that he's being annihilated. There's mm -hmm. an adventure uh, with hearts and uh, a feminine image. Mm -hmm. Well, but I want to be very careful about um, identifying with the ego attitude. He's not being annihilated, right? That's but right. He it says feels he's like annihilated. Yes. So there's a way in which the ego is saying it's too much. I'm being annihilated. I'm being buried. But the actual images in the dream don't say that. Mm -hmm floating on top of the water is not being buried. I mean, there's a way in which he doesn't know yet where dry land is, mm -hmm. but the five hearts are symbols of the self. Mm -hmm. They're symbols that he is being accompanied by some kind of a transcendent symbolic mm -hmm. force. Well, and they're also, they're, they also signify eros, don't mm -hmm. they? So again, the release of love, with the, perhaps. The feminine mm -hmm. with feeling. So yeah, there certainly is a sense. I mean, and this, you know, Deb, you brought in the flood mythology. And of course, you know, flood mythology always is about rebirth. Yes. Renewal. Yes. And alchemically, um, we know that the salutio, the dissolving process, uh, that is one of the initiatory processes of a psychoanalytic experience, it is to dissolve defenses mm -hmm. and some of uh, some of the ego's uh, sense that it's the only that this is the only thing this a person is, the, is. This is actually a great picture of the relativization of the ego. Yes, exactly. It? It's like you thought you were just yeah. in a little swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to analysis. Yeah. And you I agree with you Joseph. He's not actually yeah. being annihilated. It's just that he's been really introduced in a way that's unmistakable to the unconscious and the life of the unconscious. And, and Deb you used this word a minute ago that I think is just right. You talked about initiation. I think this is also kind of an, an mm -hmm. initiatic dream. In a sense, I I think it could be. I mean, in as much as the unconscious is but I want to venture, without knowing this person, I want to talk a little bit about schizoid defenses. Mm -hmm. And this idea that people can sometimes have such hardship 
in their childhood and or be so sensitive so even a normal childhood feels like an unbearable hardship and they erect tremendous walls and they live in sunny sacred forest glades mm -hmm. like little yeah. shrines inside that's, of themselves a good as a way of kind of connection. having a life and a life where no one else is there and a life that actually has a lot but, of still but, but that's water. actually walled off yes but it's mm -hmm. walled off and tremendously alone so when we think about the power of the heart, the power of Eros, which is quite different than living in a walled yeah. off internal sunny garden, that something inside his psyche has said, we don't need these anymore. Oh, yeah, that's, that's oh, great. A deeper wisdom said, we're washing down these childhood defenses, mm -hmm. and we're going to restore to you the capacity to have a heart the capacity to perhaps love the spouse. He says he's in relationship counseling, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or perhaps the capacity to love many people, mm -hmm. five times more people <laughs> than before, five times more hard. But as if we didn't get yes. the image the first time, the unconscious repeats it five times. Yeah. And we know in these yes. iterative repetitions, it's like the yeah. unconscious is hitting you with like a wet fish saying, listen, <laughs> listen, listen. You know, So just yeah. make sure you don't miss the hearts. Yes. The heart that survives, mm -hmm. the heart that survives the release of all of the defenses or the schizoid mm -hmm. defenses, the heart that survives the annihilation of mm -hmm. all of the old stuff that you mm -hmm. thought you needed to get by in the world. I think I, I totally want to identify with the dreamers just feeling of overwhelm mm -hmm. and yeah. concern and alarm, but I don't want to identify with that. I want to identify with the, poor, the part of him that wants him to have a totally new, yeah. extraordinary life with yes. different capacities. Yeah. That's much, much larger. Much larger, yeah. endlessly large. A breath of the large. wild. Yeah. That's yes. what Zelda is, is yeah. a breath of the wild, a fuller, more adventurous life with much more emotional range of motion, so to speak. And greatly uncertain as far as the eye can mm -hmm. see. Ah. So he's on he's like Odysseus on the ocean and mm -hmm. he doesn't know where the land is and he <laughs> don't know how he's staying afloat. Mm -hmm. But he's launched. Yeah. You know, and, and the the old land is not even in sight. <laughs> and he's scared. Yeah. He's not used to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Understandably. I think we have come to a stop for this episode of this Jungian life. And as ever, we thank the dreamer who sent us a dream, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.